time. It is, uh, yeah, it's getting more like spring. I think, you know, it's harder to be sitting inside uh, looking at a computer screen, even at seven o'clock at night when it's still light outside and uh, really a nice time to be outside, of course. So yeah, it's good that um, I think um, it's time to end these and spend more time outside looking at the real thing, the real plants and flora and fauna. So, so we're, yeah, we're going to depart from the usual plant ID strategy. Uh, this all started out, of course, way, when was it? Way back January 11th or something like that, doing plant IDs. And we've done a lot of different plants, plant groups, families, and genera. But I really thought that it would be nice to do this program because while, it, of course, it is very important that you, if you're a natural resource manager or you even managing and working on your own land, you know, having some skills to help you identify what plants are there, of course, is very important. But it's equally important, I would argue, that you understand what to do with that information, how you might use that information once you figure out what you've got. And so uh, I think it's really imperative uh, these days, as I'm going to point out here in this next slide, because you know, as as it, as we know, we are in what's called the the sixth great extinction. Um, experts tell us that the extinction rate right now, basically over the last you know probably decade or so, is about a thousand times higher than normal background rates, and that's pretty alarming. And of course, again, if you're a natural resource manager, if you're a land manager, one of your most important charges, your most important responsibilities is to conserve and protect the Earth's biodiversity. And it's getting harder, of course, to do that. There's, a, unfortunately, a long list of reasons here of, uh, again, why this is becoming such a great challenge. And it's probably not gonna get any better, of course, as the way things are going. We uh, look at five of these, highlight five of these, those five right there. Um, the great scientist, um, uh, oh gosh, um, now I'm, I'm skipping on his, his name. He wrote uh, Biodiversity. Anyone remember him, who I'm talking Wilson. about? Ed Wilson, there we go, thank Hello. you. Yeah, Ed Wilson um, coined the term HIPPO here to, as an acronym to point out what he felt were the, probably the five most important causes of the loss of biodiversity, as you can see there. But no doubt uh, those other factors, and we could put global climate change in there as, as another factor, of course, because that's, uh, that's upon us. And so it really becomes crucially essential that natural resource managers really, um, you know, are at the top of their game, so to speak, and are embracing the most you know, efficient and adaptive comprehensive strategies, as, as points out there, you really have to be very efficient. Because again, one of the problems is dwindling conservation dollars. And quite often, um, unsat unsatisfactory and ill-conceived policy that you know, you're, you're going up against those problems as well. And so there's a Again, a, a list of things here. This comes from Groves at Al 2002, that reference down there at the bottom of, of some of the ways in which natural resource managers need to react and, and uh, sort of improve their game. And basically what most of this comes down to here, these, these seven steps is that they kind of revolve around really having a, a better understanding of what you've got, what you're working with, what it means, uh, because you're gonna have to set priorities. You have to set goals and you can't really do that very well if you don't know what you're working with. So that's where plant conservatism comes in. And uh, this is something, of course, that's been around since about the 70s, as you can see here. Jerry Wilhelm and Floyd Swink uh, elaborated on it quite uh, at length and in great um, detail in the plants of the Chicago region, that volume there. Uh, Jerry had actually introduced the idea a couple years earlier in a report that he uh, sent to Kane County, Illinois, and uh, some work that he had done for them. And of course, this, is, this idea was to utilize plants as a way to help understand and, and use sort of at least a semi-objective approach to getting an assessment, uh, an ecological assessment, probably the best way to describe it, a uh, measure of, of uh, community or ecosystem quality. 
And what they did was they came up with this conservatism idea and a scale that um, originally looked like this. So they used uh, zero to 10 and then 15 and 20 were the possible coefficients that they used. These were applied to native species. And you can see here, they kind of defined, you know, a native species would be zero if it was sort of fit this kind of a description, very ubiquitous, very common, find it in all kinds of environments, not very specialized or particular about, you know, where it grows. And then we go up to scale, get more conservative, um, five, a little bit more of a, specific type of community or environment that it's going to be found in, more of a, an advanced successional phase. And we're going to see how succession works into this. And then of course, at the top end 10, um, so these would be species that characterize, you know, more climax type communities. Climax is a term to describe a plant community very near the end of a successional sear and also a, a community that's able to replace itself. And again, these, these environments then become more specific. They also use 15 and 20, as you can see down here, to provide even an added level of conservatism, you know, higher amount yet. Uh, obviously 15 and 20 or one and a half and two times a value of, of a 10, uh, basically apply to, <clears throat> excuse me, to threatened or endangered otherwise rare species. They also <clears throat> utilized um, this scale for non-native species, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> going from zero to a negative three or from zero to a two. Using again these descriptions you see here. So uh, zero of course would mean this is non-native species. It's basically sort of detrimental. Now, they looked at it in a very, very broad way though. Uh, looking at you know, undermining the quality of the of the community, poisonous or illegal. I'm not sure what illegal means, but uh, exhibit preemptive roles. Preemptive means that they take over space easily and occupy space and prevent other perhaps native species from being able to establish. So maybe a minus one, two, or three for those. Zero, these would be non-native species that really don't have any, but at least they perceive not much impact or any kind of effect really on what's happening in those plant communities. And then they even gave some non-native species positive values if they thought that it actually has some kind of you know, value as, as, as you can see here is perhaps uh, providing some wildlife food or, and this gets very subjective, you know, are interesting or showy. Um, that's getting into you no know, more, I guess, a, a human perception of what we like and what we don't like. Well, as it turns out that the 15 and 20 aspect up here and the non-native uh, component down here really didn't hang on at all very well in this as it, as it got to uh, sort of spread to other states and was kind of dropped. Those we don't really see much anymore. Here's a map from this publication by Spireus which is actually a pretty good paper if you want to get sort of just an overall sort of uh, understanding of what the coefficients of conservatism, what that scale is all about. He provides a nice critique and, and a primer on it. This is a map from his paper and it shows uh, the states that have some type of um, coefficient of conservatism concept. They have a, at least some kind of a list with um, the coefficients or C values. We'll use the term C value. That's usually the term that's used to apply to the, the coefficient. And you can see, I, I looked up some of these. I didn't get a chance to look them all up. You can see that, you know, what the shading means here. The gray means um, the, the uh, species, the complete flora has been assigned. The native flora has been assigned the C value, at least one set of, of C value scores. The dark ones, of course, say that there's actually more than one set of scores. And actually that's, that's how Iowa should be colored. It should be dark because there is the one list that's general for the entire floor of Iowa. But then there's also another subset list. I worked with uh, Bill and Dan Blankenship and Brian Hazlitt to produce a list for the Lus Hills. So we have a second set of scores, but it's just, just for the Lus Hills. And then there's some partial floors, as you can see, with, with the cross hatching, which they've done for like down here in Louisiana, for example, there's some coefficients that have been published for the, the coastal prairies. 
but not for the, the rest of the, of the flora. What I've superimposed here is you know, the, the general trend that we see in terms of how they use this. Um, the zero to 10 means that they've, again, basically adopted just this portion right here, zero to 10. Native species are assigned either a zero or up to a 10 as their C value. And that's really you know, pretty consistent. You can see a couple exceptions. Iowa here, well, the first list was zero to 10 as we're gonna talk about. The revised list is now changed to one to 10. And also the New York and New England states also have the same, they use the same concept there, the same philosophy uh, of starting the, non, the native species uh, at one rather than starting them at, at zero. The asterisk here means that there is a confidence score that's also been provided and that's true again with the revised list I'm gonna be showing you, this is also a confidence score. Uh, the uh, number sign here means that what Louisiana has done, at, at least at, on the coastal prairies, is they've adopted a negative value, a C value, a negative value for non-native species. And not very many states do that, as you can see, that's the only place where you see that. And what the B means right here for Ohio is that they've actually done it for um, all the vascular plants. That's what all of these lists are for the vascular plants, but Ohio's also done it for bryophytes as well, so the mosses. So you can see that it's pretty well entrenched throughout most of the country. The, the western states and southern southwestern states haven't picked up on it yet, apparently. So here's a definition of what conservatism means. This actually comes from the uh, Washington publication where they, uh, Rochelle and Crawford published their C values for their flora. And, and this is a pretty good one. I think that this, this is why I used it here is because I think it does really um, completely sort of in, um, embrace what I think we mean, or what should be mean or what you should be thinking about when you describe what a conservative species is. And they, they use the definition of intact ecosystems in here, they use that, that um, in their definition. So I've also defined what, again, what Rocio and Crawford say what an intact ecosystem is. And this is basically, again, looking at an ecosystem that would be um, representative of the historic ecosystems, the pre-European ecosystems that were, were present. All right, so one question, of course, is does plant conservatism work? Is it, because again, as you see in that map, not all states are embracing it. And I've talked to people uh, and seen some, some papers that, um, and that, that Spireus paper does provide a critique, in which you know, there's some question, well, does this even make sense to do this? Uh, on one side, I would say on the pro side, so arguing, yes, it does work. This is a legitimate uh, endeavor. I would say these are some reasons for saying that. Plants are strang, strongly, obviously tied to the environments. They're, they're immobile, they're not moving around. It would be much harder to do this with an animal species. I know I've not really seen this apply to any, anything. I've heard maybe, maybe someone was doing something for butterflies maybe or some insects, but I've not really seen that. And it's again, because, you know, because animals are mobile, uh, it's, it's just a little bit less, you're less able to make that strong connection between them and the environment. If they don't like something about the environment, they can, they can leave. Plants can't do that. And so that's, that's one reason going for this that, that helps to make sense. Another uh, outcome of that then is because they're tied to the environment, then that must mean that when you look at a community, a plant community, the, the species that are present there, um, should, in a sense, and sort of provide some kind of reflection on that ecosystem's condition. What, what's the situation there? What kind of environmental condition is that system in? That's sort of a logical um, next step from plants being tied to their environment. And we also know that plants have, of course, evolved uh, many different strategies in terms of their life histories. The life histories, uh, what that refers to is how any species um, solves the problem of how to allocate energy to either uh, growth, maintenance, or reproduction. Those are the three, three things that energy has to be allocated to 
and of course, eventually to reproduction in order to have reproductive fit, fitness. And so um, all species, plants included, have evolved different types of life history strategies than that best serve um, their ability to, to grow, to maintain themselves and to reproduce in whatever, in whatever their environment is in. These life history strategies then are uh, useful in terms of thinking about you know, what their uh, conservatism might be because there's a paper published that shows, and this is the publication right there, Ficken and Rooney, that shows that there are many significant relationships that occur between published C values. They just, they just got lists of, of published C values from different states, mainly from the upper Midwest. And then they, they looked at all kinds of, of functional and ecological life history characteristics of those species. And they found lots of significant relationships that occur between the C values and these functional traits. For example, they found that species that are fire tolerant had C scores that were generally about three and a half units or values lower than intolerant species. They also found that shade tolerant species had C scores or values that were on average four units higher than species that are intolerant to, to shade. And, and there's, there's several more. Uh, so there's a pretty strong connection there then between uh, life history strategies, functional traits, uh, evolutionarily determined characteristics of plants and what their C values are. To me, that, that, that says that there's a, a strong um, positive uh, then reinforcement that, that these, this idea is, is, is gonna work, that, that it makes sense. On the other side, some of the critiques, and we won't spend too much time on these, but one is that um, plant conservatism is beset with circularity. What they're talking about here is that basically the idea is, is that, so we, we assign C values based on our experiences of where we see these plants and we judge those places, those habitats and, 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 and figure out whether they're, you know, what kind of quality they are by the, by the species composition, by what plants we find there. So you're using the plants to tell you whether it's, you know, high quality, medium quality or low quality. And then you're, then you're trying to, again, put a C value on the plants that are occurring there. So you can see there is a little bit of circularity there. And that's, and that's, that's true to some extent, but it's really, does, does that, that does not mean that it has to be a problem. It does not mean that this then is something that has to sort of just negate this as something that's not going to work. When, when the group that I work with, you're gonna meet these people in a little bit, sort of about um, assigning seed values to Iowa plants, we, we use it, um, many characteristics. Yeah, we, we, we think about the areas that we see them, and we kind of you know have some kind of judgment on what kind of quality those areas are by the by the floor that we saw there. But also, I would argue we use uh, physical aspects of the environment. Uh, we use structural aspects of the community to help us to help inform us again, of sort of what what kind of quality that that plant community was. Another one that's uh, critique is plant conservatism is subjective. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's true. It's somewhat subjective, um, but that again doesn't mean that we don't have any value in this. I would say again, there is always, you know, some subjectivity probably in, in much of what we do. Uh, when we assign these C values again, it's being done by a group of botanists, field botanists with, well, in case, in our case, probably, um, I hate to guess, but probably over, clearly over a hundred years of experience uh, seeing plants in the field under different conditions, different environments. And so it's that collective wisdom by this group of people that, that is used to assign what those C values are. So it's, it's not like we're just taking a guess. We're, we're using this collective wisdom and, and, and discussing and arguing uh, you know, where we think that C value should, should go. Another um, Critique is that rare species are biased towards high C values. Again, that is true. It is true that rare species tend to have higher C values. There is clearly a correlation between um, C values and rare species. But again, it's critical to, and this is very critical for you to understand, 
uh, that conservatism and rarity are not the same thing at all. We're not measuring the same thing at all. It so happens that in some cases, uh, it is true that rare species are also conservative species. That's really not unusual. You sort of expect that to some extent. But there's many cases of, of you know, conservative species that are um, low conservative species and may be uh, threatened or endangered. Uh, because again, threatened and endangered can come about for many different reasons. Uh, mainly you no know, habitat loss, but also sort of how those species, um, how their biogeography, how their biogeography sort of fits with political state boundaries. So again, um, not not a problem really. We we expect that to some extent. Just don't make the mistake of thinking that they are uh, that they mean the same thing. There's a correlation. Correlation means that they're weakly related to each other. They tend to go up together or go down together. But they don't mean the same thing. And then another uh, critique is that spe species C values are imprecise. And I would say, yep, that's true. Uh, imprecision is inherent in much of the ecological measurements that we do. It's difficult to measure things precisely. And again, this is certainly something that's difficult to measure in any precise way. Again, I go back to the, the collective wisdom of a group of, of people who have you know, um, a long history and experience of, of seeing these species. One of the, the traits of plants though that we can't get around, we can't do anything about that plants have is acclimation. Acclimation is the ability for individuals to acclimate or to adjust their phenotypes, to adjust their morphology or adjust their physiology, adjust their anatomy in ways that make them better suited to the environment. But it happens at an individual level. It is something that, that species are able to do because they are adapted to be able to acclimate or not, but it happens at an individual level. So in that sense, it's, it's not the same as adaptation. It's, it's different. Plants are very good at acclimation. I think basically because they're strongly tied to their environment. Um, they, another way of describing this that's been used is, is, the, is plasticity. They, they're able to, again, individuals can, can change their morphology in ways, again, that make them better suited to where they are. That makes, it, <clears throat> excuse me, that makes them then better able to cope with a range of environments. And so it is possible that uh, you can see, for example, um, uh, just as a quick example, species we're going to be seeing here soon, the uh, white trout lily, the spring ephemeral. We um, tend to think of that as a fairly conservative species. I don't remember what its coefficient is or C value, probably at least a seven or something like that, which is in the high, high range. I've seen um, some white trout lilies in pretty trashy woods that clearly would not um, give you an indication that it should have a C value of, of seven. Uh, there is that amount of variation. There is going to be variation in what these C values really would be if we were, to, were able to measure them in some precise way because of acc acclimation. There's not much, again, we can do about this. We have to sort of live with it. Uh, it would be possible to probably put a standard deviation on these C values and, and use that as a way to sort of describe what kind of variation there is there. But that would just make it much more complex to try to use and to apply them. So, and really, um, it's, it's really not that much of a big deal when it comes down to how these are, are implemented in the final picture, as we're going to see towards the end of this, because we use the C values for many, many species. And so while there, are, there may be some, you know, there's going to be variation in those, we tend to see that it sort of, you know, uh, kind of cancels out somewhat. And so that the, the FQIs, for example, for this quality index, uh, which is a way of using the C values, uh, tends to be more precise than what you would, would think it would be because of that. There are some other things that I didn't put on here that are also critiqued. Uh, one is that um, the plant conservatism concepts as we're seeing here don't really have any mechanism for incorporating species abundance. I would say baloney on that. There certainly is, you just have to do it and I'll show you how. And there's another uh, critique that says that, uh, you know, there's too much emphasis placed on conservatism and the FQI, the fluorescent quality assessments. 
you know, it's just a single measurement. It has too much influence on, on decisions that have to be made about, you know, what you're going to do or what, what properties you might try to acquire or things of that nature. Um, a more comprehensive, you know, type of assessment should be done. And I would say that criticism is completely justifiable. You shouldn't use just the FQI as the only measure of, uh, of assessment, of ecological assessment. You should use many variables. And I'm going to show you again how you do that. Uh, it's not that hard. So those two critiques can easily be, be solved. Um, we have a question here, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, if higher conservatism species are later or tend to be later successional species, does it make sense to include them at the onset of a prairie reconstruction or sometime afterwards, such as interceding at a later time? That's a good question. I would probably consider them uh, at the beginning because what, what that means is those species generally take much more time to establish, much more time to mature, much more time to get to a, rep a, re a reproductive and uh, you know fully functioning population, you might say, and so they they reach that point. Then you know some years after the seeding. Quick example I've seen with my own work on prairie reconstruction along I-35 in Story County was that. Um, lead plant. We didn't really start seeing lead plant showing up and and even seeing the plants until probably three to four years into the seeding. And then um, mature plants and plants, you know, re reproducing, um, I don't think we even saw any after seven years. So, so I, I think it would, you know, most likely be best to go, and go ahead and include those at the very, very beginning. Um, if you're going to put them in later, you'd have to probably make some disturbances of some kind in order to uh, give them the advantage that you're going to need to, to get established. Okay, so here is, again, uh, how to think about this concept of conservatism. Uh, I've got a gradient here that shows the idea of succession, and here's our numbers from 0 to 10. And again, lower numbers, lower C values would represent species that tend to occupy and establish in early successional environments after disturbances. So a, a disturbance happens and succession begins. And so those first communities that occupy those sites are called early successional. And then if no other disturbances happen over time, the communities gradually change through successional processes. We can't get into all those tonight into uh, something that's a little bit different. This is going to be a different community than this one here with different species. And finally, again, a late succession or more of a climax type of community that's able to replace itself. So again, this is again a way of thinking about um, where these coefficients or C values go. Another way of, of thinking about that is with disturbance. And so again, uh, and especially important here is there's a negative correlation, basically increasing coefficient, decreasing, um, or of course, increasing favorable response to human disturbance. This is, this is increasing this way. So as species become more and more adept at dealing with human disturbances, anthropogenic disturbances, um, they deserve lower and lower C, C value scores. And of course, the cor corollary of that is that then those species that have higher C values, these are species that have this increasing requirement for natural and pristine environments, environments that lack human disturbance. So human disturbance is a very important part of this. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in just a second here. So people ask me again, well, what, what's a good easy way of thinking about what a, you know, a C value means? So here's what I would say, given a C value of three, for example, say some species has a C value of three. What that tells me, the way I like to think about it, and this is often the way that, that the, the group of us thought about this as we tried to, um, again, come up with the, the best C value for a species, is that the presence of this species, whatever it might be in a community, that would suggest to me that there's about a 30% probability that that community where this species was found is a natural pristine ecosystem. That's a good way to think about it. Uh, so again, if, if someone brought me a plant 
I don't I have no idea where it came from. I looked at it and I said, oh, this is this has a C value of three. I said, well, the place where you got this has a 30% probability of being a, a really nice natural pristine place. Okay, so coming back to disturbances. So this is a difficult part of assigning C values then is we have to sort of separate anthropogenic disturbances in a sense from natural disturbances. And that's not always easy. But what we tried to do again in our committee, in our work group, was to think about it this way. We, we thought about anthropogenic disturbances as these types of places. And if, and if we see species really increasing or, or really being favored by these kinds of places, then that would indicate again, they should have a lower uh, C, C value. Natural disturbances, we have to separate into types that promote either secondary succession or primary succession. So there's two types of succession that occur, secondary or primary. Uh, secondary is a type of succession that occurs when disturbance occurs, but there's still a lot of biological legacy. I like to use the term biological legacy, meaning there's still lots of life, biological life present on the site namely seed banks and root systems. And so uh, that means that the starting point after that disturbance and there was those early successional communities have a whole different you know, type of environment that they're dealing with. They've got fully intact soil. The soil is still there. Soil is biological le legacy. So here's some examples again of, of you know, what would happen um, what, type, what type, types of disturbances, I should say, that would result in a secondary su su succession. Primary succession is harder. It's certainly a lot um, less common. Uh, and, and we don't really see disturbances around anymore that cause primary succession. But a couple of examples where we would still be seeing some of the effects of that would be uh, any kind of uh, aeolian sand dunes where the sand deposits are fairly deep. So. Uh, of course, most of our sand prairies that are growing in some of these environments have been there for thousands of years. So uh, it, they're quite a ways down the road in terms of where their, where their su su succession is. But some, some places like Big Sand Mound, for example, which has upwards of uh, oh, 60 feet of, of sand at least, and, and some places are uh, pretty barren in terms of you know, the amount of vegetation there. That's a little bit more representative of still sort of a primary successional type of in environment. Paleosols are really, really, really old, old ancient soils that are exposed at the land surface. And we see some of those in the Southern Iowa Drift Plain. These are places, again, primary succession. And the next slide is going to help us understand this because a good way to think about plants and again, how they fit into succession and into uh, life history strategies is with the Grimes Triangle, which is uh, basically taking what many of you probably know about you know, R and K selection, life history strategies for R and K selection for mammals and birds and reptiles and, and insects. But for plants, we say that doesn't work very well because plants are different. And plants, again, are gonna allocate energy to any one of those three things I mentioned, either to maintenance, if they allocate a lot of energy to maintenance, they're gonna be a stress tolerator. Let's just go through the slides here. Um, if there are selected over here, a root roll, they're allocating energy more to reproduction. Their strategy is to colonize relatively fertile disturbances, usually secondary successional kinds of sites. If they are a C selected species, then their strategies allocate energy more to growth so that they have a strategy that's able to compete better, again, in relatively fertile, but now late successional sites. And if they are better described as an S-selected species, that means they allocate energy to maintenance. Their strategy is just to survive, survive stressful environments, usually primary successional environments, because these usually have very stressful conditions like low fertility, high temperatures, low moisture. Uh, those are the kinds of stressors in the environment then that would, would say, well, the best way to, to deal with this is to just maintain yourself. So that gives us the S, C, and R selected species, which again are ways of allocating energy to one of those, one of those three options that, that plants have. 
Now I bring this up because it's easy for, um, again, I think people who aren't really thinking about this or keen on this to throw these two species both into the same category as being weedy species, being a ruderal species, but really they're not. Uh, this is giant ragweed and it's definitely a good example of a ruderal species. It loves to colonize disturbances in, in uh, fertile soil. But this is prairie threon. Prairie threon uh, is, is more adept at coping in really stressful environments. Some of those um, paleosols or some of those really deep sand environments where again, the fertility is very, very low. And so they're dealing with low nutrient levels. In fact, prairie threon is elip, um, has some allelopathic chemicals that it produces to actually help decrease the uh, abundance of, of rhizobium bacteria, the bacteria that would uh, form root nodules with legumes and, and produce nitrogen and actually slowly increase the fertility of the soil. Uh, Prairie threon doesn't want that to happen because they want to be able to, again, they compete better with other species in those low, low fertility sites. So again, uh, we, would, we would not put these together and, and say they, these are both you know, low C value plants because they're, they're, they have different strategies. This is an, more of an S-selected species. This is an R-selected species. This one deserves a low C value. This one does not. So in succession, then root rolls in, in the secondary su succession, these species you know, gradually become more and more C-selected species through, through time. Root rolls are replaced by more C-selected species. In, uh, primary succession, which takes a lot longer time, is much slower. That's why I put the dash line in there. It's more of this kind of situation, where S-selected species are gradually replaced by C-selected species. All right, so the first uh, list of coefficients was done in 1999 and published in 2000 by this group of uh, eight people here. You can uh, see their names from left to right across the bottom here. It was facilitated by none other than Jerry Wilhelm. The, the, point in the, the arrow there points at Jerry. He came over to the Prairie Learning Center and, and just again, uh, not so much as an expert on Iowa plants, but as an expert on the concept of plant conservatism and, and help um, the other seven folks that you see, um, you know, think about uh, what, are the, what are the factors and what, what, what characteristics and, and what kind of thought process you, know, you go through as you try to assign the C values to all the native plants. So that again came out in 2000 in an Excel file that's been available on the, um, at the Ada Hayden Herbarium website for at least for a while. Not sure if it's still there or not, maybe not. This group decided that in 2014, it was time to uh, revise that list. And so there's uh, five members of the original team here and two new members, myself and Mark Riedelechner, uh, so again, seven people. We didn't have, uh, Jerry didn't come over and help us. This was a much longer process. This one again here was over four days. This one was 14 days over a period of four years. And uh, the whole process here was much more deliberative and I would say much more um, scientific in some ways, as I'm gonna point out. We've also had uh, four expert reviewers now give us some feedback on that revised list. Well, uh, Bill Norris from University of uh, Western New Mexico, Beth Lynch up at Luther, Brian Hazlitt over at Briarcliff, and Michael Ingolay at Wartburg. So what did we do? Well, the first big issue that we tackled, and, and as I've kind of alluded to this earlier in that slide on the map, is that, you know, in the original list, under the influence of Jerry Wilhelm, I would say, uh, they gave zeros to many native species. If they were considered to be a native ruderal species, our selected species, it didn't really convey much uh, idea about you know, the quality of the environment. They gave those species zeros. Well, the problem with that, that I brought up to my group, because I wanted this to change, was that that makes them equal to non-native species because non-native species are zero by default. Non-native species don't get a coefficient because they're not native, of course, they don't even get one. If so, if you include them in the analysis though, in the assessment, they are by default zeros. So you, you're, you're not distinguishing between these two groups. And I thought that was a real problem because I would agree 
and actually got into a fairly long discussion about this with, with Jerry. Um, he, we asked him to review our list, one of these uh, reviewers, but he declined to review just on the basis of that, that we had made this change and he um, didn't really approve of that. So, but my argument to him was that, um, well, it's pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, to me, all native species have more value than the non-native species. And the idea here is simply that, yes, non-native rural species, like, you know, um, common ragweed, common milkweed, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to indicate that the environment, you know, doesn't really have much um, conservative value because they are rural species, but I'd rather have them uh, telling me that than a non-native species. Because what, what seemed to escape, and what seems to be escaping ever all those other states that are using that same idea of zero as a starting point for native species is that these native rurals are doing important function in the ecosystem. They are colonizing these disturbances that happen and those are the very species we need to have there to do that because that's what they're good at. That's what they evolved their life history strategy to do and they're doing it. And at the same time, they're providing food for insects and other animals that have evolved with those species over again, thousands and millions of years and have connections with those, those plants that again, they don't have those connections with non-native species if they didn't, they didn't evolve with those species. So it just seemed like to me a non-brainer, uh, you know, just not not even very de very debatable that, that native species should at least have a one or higher even um, because they need to be distinguished from the non-native species. So we did that. We also, as I said, uh, spent 14 days doing this, and so we really uh, did a lot of research. We checked vouchers and herbarium to just get more information to help us make assessments, especially for species that none of us really had very much experience with. Because otherwise, you know, if we don't have much experience with it, we're kind of just you know shooting in the, you know shooting blindly. But we tried to figure out as best we could uh, where that seed value should be by doing some work. Uh, and as I said, we also assign a low, medium, or high confidence to each one. So each species gets a C value, then it gets a low, medium, or high confidence in terms of how confident we are that we have a accurate measure of what that C value is. And this is really based upon just what information we had to go on. Another thing that came up that I don't know if the first group talked about this much, is, but we debated quite a bit. And you know, we have the problem now, we have lots of reconstructions out on the landscape. We sometimes, of course, see and experience species in reconstructions, but we really can't. We really can't use those in any way. We have to separate those observations out, sort of discount those, because those are reconstructions. Those are those the species you're seeing that were planted there. Someone picked that species to grow on that site. Uh, it's 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 not the same thing again as looking at at what nature has has done. So um, we made sure to do that. Here's some examples of some changes then. So here's um, snow in the mountain here on the left and wing loose stripe on the right. We can see that uh, these both went up quite a bit. Snow in the mountain was a zero. It way, went way up to four and wing loose stripe went from three to six. Both of them have a high comp confidence level. Here's a couple of examples of some that went down. Frank Sedge went from eight to five and uh, sweet center bed straw, that one definitely needed to go down. Um, I probably would have argued for even probably less than that, but it went down to uh, five at least. Here's some, just some quick stats on kind of the change uh, distribution of the original C values. Uh, you can see kind of again, the numbers that have each of these different C value scores there roughly what the average uh, C value score would be out of a sample of 1488. And here's the uh, new list, it has a few uh, less species um, for various reasons. But you can see again, uh, there's no zeros here. So there was a shift upward basically, as we shifted you know, species upward some, somewhat. So the mean did go up a little bit. And here's a quick graph that shows the distribution of the actual amount of change. When I calculated how much did a C value actually change? Well, by and large, most of them didn't change at all. 
um, almost 700 species didn't change at all, had, had the same seed value that they had first time through. But again, some of them went up, um, no, very few, but some went up as much as uh, five, uh, one went up by seven. So some really changed. Um, most of these, you know, there's a little bit more of a distribution here on the right side. So there was more, more of the species went up some by you know, one or two um, points, you might say. Uh, a little fewer went down. So the tendency was to, try, to generally increase, if there was a change, the tendency was to generally increase it some, somewhat. Okay, how do you apply these? So the rest of this, and I'll have to kind of speed through this with another you know, 10 minutes here. Uh, I'm gonna show you how this can be applied with a project that I've been working on since 2017. And I'm working on the final report right now. It's a project called the Story County of Sensitive Areas Inventory. Uh, you, you'll, able to, you'll be able to you know, go through this and read this on the handout that I provided. So again, I'm not gonna have time to um, elaborate real deeply on all of this, but here's some of the goals. We want to try to look at 10,000 acres roughly of mostly private land and conduct inventories, plant uh, heuristic inventories on those lands. And again, basically get species composition, plant species composition of all of the different ecosystems and communities that we were able to map and identify. And we wanted to characterize community structure. I'll talk about that. We looked at other things anecdotally just to um, in case we happen to see something cool, some cool fungi, invertebrates or vertebrates. But basically this was collecting data to do some of those things that I had on that, you know, that, that first slide, providing natural resource managers with much better information on what they've got. And again, the reason why this was, let me back up, the reason why we focused on private land up here is because you no know, story County knows pretty much what they've got on public land, at least has some idea. And really, again, to, to, to go forward from where we are right now with biodiversity, conservation and protection, there needs to be much more uh, cooperation and work focused on private land. Because we, we can't conserve enough, at least in Iowa, we can't conserve enough habitat if we're just looking at public land only. We don't have that much. And so we have to be able to work on private land whenever it's possible. So that was the idea here was to get a better handle on what's out there on private land. And that would allow Story County then the ability to prioritize areas, privately owned areas and go out and reach out to those landowners and, and work with them maybe in terms of easements or, or try to find grant money to hire conservation core crews to go onto those private lands and help those landowners do whatever needs to be done to uh, make that, that habitat better. So again, these are some of the uh, things that the project was working on. Here's some real just quick numbers. Um, again, um, basically three field seasons. I did do a few more sites in 2020. All of our field work was done basically by just doing a single visit to these, these sites and doing a, a floristic inventory on just one day. We couldn't really afford repeat visits because we're trying to cover 10,000 acres or more. Um, I, we didn't get to that, but I think we probably got close to 7,000 or so. In order to do this on a single visit, you have to be able to identify plants. Basically, 90% of your vegetation is you know, in vegetative state, uh, no flowers. And so you have to be able to identify plants vegetatively. Uh, again, probably at least 90% of the plant IDs are going to be that way. So I hired Bill Norris to help me with this because I feel he's got um, you know, enough uh, plant ID skills. He's probably not quite as good as me, but he's close enough that I felt that he would be a good help. Uh, here's, here's the amount of time we put into it. Uh, we mapped and collected floristic data on 717 plant communities and ecosystems. And so every one of those plant communities and ecosystems has a tentative name of what we called it and has a floristic inventory. And that floristic inventory is being used then to calculate these 65 community variables that are gonna help convey some measure of what the community ecosystem condition is like. This is based on over 34,000 observations of a plant and what its abundance is in a community. All right, so I'm gonna, um, here's a quick map that shows Story County and um, most of this is showing the shaded areas or places that during phase one was just a desktop survey of aerial photography to, to find places that basically are not farm ground. <laughs> so this is just showing us these areas are places we wanna go because it's not a cornfield, it's something else. It's some kind of forest or pasture or grassland, CRP or something like that. 
So those are the places we focused on. We got permission to go out there and do the surveys. We use a real quick uh, survey method again, make a plant list, but we assign a quick measure of abundance based on the frequency of that plant in the community. These four uh, that are highlighted here are the basic levels that we use, sparse, occasional, frequent, very common, and what those mean in terms of absolute frequency. This is sort of looking at um, how frequent a species is in the community. If I were to put 100 randomly arranged or located square meter quadrats out there, what percentage of them would have that species present? That's what this means. That's how we think about it. We also use some intermediate categories here, as you can see. So that's how we got our measurement of abundance. We also looked at woody structure. So every woody plant, every single woody plant, we wrote down what size classes we were seizing, seeing using these terms. Seedling sprouts, if it was less than 50 centimeters tall. Shrub, if it's in between 50 and 200. A sapling, if it's more than 200, but less than five centimeters DBH. And then trees, every single tree that's over five centimeters GBH, we recorded DBHs to the nearest five centimeters. So again, this is getting woody structure, getting a measure again of, of the different size classes of woody vegetation, because this is gonna be key to helping us understand what successional status those plant communities are in. A quick example would be, we might have seen green ash in a plant community, given it a, a frequency of 20% and recorded individuals in all of these size classes. And here's another example of bur oak. We saw it in a community. This is actual data. It got a frequency of 20%. And these were the sizes. These are all trees, of course, uh, sizes of trees that, that we saw. In, uh, so any individual of any size, that size was, was recorded. We didn't record how many trees, just that the, there is at least, a, we know what, there's at least one stem that's present in this community that is in these different si sizes. Okay, this is a, um, again, how I use plant conservatism now. So we're using the revised list. So we don't have any native species that are zero. All of our native species start at one and go up to 10. I also use negative coefficients for the invasive non-native species. Every single non-native species gets a negative coefficient. So for example, in this case here, um, whoops, sorry. Um, Canada thistle gets a negative three because it's really bad. Common evening primrose is a two, cardinal flower is a six, and uh, this is prairie gray sedge, Carex canodia is an actual 10. These are all species that we had. So I'm using negative species because, or excuse me, using negative coefficients because I want to reflect that negative effect that those species have on the quality. Another okay. question here. Oh, okay, sure. Under a scenario of climate change, would the non-native species today become the natives of tomorrow? Hence, a place for at least some non-native species. No, not, not, not in my mind, it wouldn't. They're non-native because they've come from a different continent. They didn't evolve here. Um, you could argue, I suppose, a thousand years, a couple thousand, 10,000 years, of, of evolution would then rightly make them a native species, I suppose, at some point, but not yet. <laughs> Most of them have, you know, they've only been here for a hundred years or, or so. So I, I'd say no. Okay, now speeding up. So as I pointed out, we're gonna use plant conservatism here. And here's, how, here's how I use it. A whole bunch of variables. These are a pretty, I'm not gonna have time to explain all of these, but. So most of these are fairly in intuitive. So this is just looking at all of the native forbs and what's the mean conservatism. Uh, looking at the, all the native grasses or graminoids and all the native woody plants. And then I also, because we have these frequency measurements, I also calculated a, a weighted mean conservatism for all, the, all of the herbaceous. This combines forbs and grasses together as herbaceous plants or the woody plants. Um, all of the herbaceous, so this is going to, these two just include natives, as you can see here, native. These two, all herbaceous, all woody, this includes native and non-native. So here, these are going to be influenced by the negative coefficients that non-native species have. That's gonna decrease the mean conservatism. 
And the fact that these are weighted, it means this is how it's calculated. The abundance of the species, the frequency is used as a weight measure, as a weighting factor to weight the C value, make it count for more or less depending upon the abundance of the species. So the way you calculate a weighted mean conservatism is to take the species C value times its frequency in the community, add all of those up for all of the species and divide by the sum of all the frequencies. Again, this is just going to make species that are more abundant, they're going to have a, a bigger effect on what that mean conservatism is. I think it's a better measure of what the uh, quality is going to be. These up here are not weighted. All the species up here count for the same amount. So rare species up here have the same effect as a common species. Down here, common species have more of an effect than rare species. Uh, this is called the number of species that were high conservative by definition, a C value of seven or more. So just how many species have a C value greater than or greater or equal to seven and how many are low conservative, have a C value of, of one or two. And then I look at the percentage of, of the number of these species and what percentage of those um, is there compared to the number of native species that we have? What percentage is that? So again, there's, there's lots of uh, variables here. I don't have time to explain all of them. Um, this is a way of getting a measure of kind of what the negative effect of non-native species is. That's how it's calculated there. Uh, no various kinds of math. And then the most, one of the most important things though for conservatism is what's called the FQI, the Floristic Quality Index. I did two of them. One for just looking at just the native species and, and not weighting them. All native species have the same weight. Then I did one for all species, but using a weighted measure for that. And so again, FQI is just, it takes the, the mean conservatism, whatever it might be, uh, if it's weighted or not, takes that times the square root of the richness, the number of species that uh, go into this, this mean. And that gives you the FQI. Well, again, so as pointed out, you know, using just one variable FQI, especially, you know, is, is you shouldn't rely just on one. So I'm going to have to buzz through the rest of these, but I calculated a whole lot more variables. I don't use just one variable. There's all kinds of plant richness variables. It's just simply looking at the number of species. That's what richness is, the number of species. These are pretty intuitive, the numbers of species in those different uh, cl classes. We separated out, and this is, again, something that most surveys don't, species that are native to Iowa, but not native to Story County. Yeah, because those are problems. We can't just, just say, oh, it's native to Iowa. We have to think about what's native to the county that we're working in. Most of these species, and there were 20 of these species, are in Story County because they were planted by people who didn't know what they were doing. And they planted species that are not native to Story County. Uh, more richness uh, variables, because we have measurements of frequency, there's, there's all kinds of variables that reflect, again, the frequency of species in all these different groups. Going to really buzz through these, sorry. Um, some of these are fairly intuitive, others not quite so much, but you can always ask me questions. I calculate a prairie indicator value on a scale of one to or zero to five. Uh, that's based on this right here, this scale. This species here, a common four o'clock would be zero. I don't consider it to be a, a, a good indicator of prairie. Um, Hori Vervain, I would give a one. It's somewhat of an indicator of prairie. Uh, while Bergamot, I give a two. Uh, Scribner's panic, ga panic grass. Let's see, where am I at here? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this one is a, is, is a one. I've got five right here, and that corresponds to these five right here. So sorry, this one would be a one, the wild four o'clock. It's somewhat of a prairie indicator, not real good, but somewhat. Uh, Hori River Veins a two, Bergamot's a three, Scribner's Panic Grass is a four, and Prairie Blazing Star is a five. I use these then to calculate uh, various um, variables that describe the quality of a, a prairie. Uh, I use the wetland affinity variables. Uh, these are the wetland affinity values, the scores that are provided by the Fish and Wildlife Service that are used in wetland mitigation work. And I use these to calculate these five variables. 
I use those Woody structural variables to calculate all of these variables. Uh, again, um, more times needed to go through this. I calculate old growth in indices based on the sizes of trees that we record out there. That's again why we re record the sizes of trees. So I can calculate this old growth measure here. Uh, I won't have time to go through this. This ex just explains how that's done. What I want to get to is this then. So oh, that's 65 variables. And you can use those 65 variables to, to glean all kinds of information about every single community that we've mapped and we have a species list for. And, and all those different variables tell you different things. I also wanted to provide story kind of with, with a, a more concrete and, and like one number measure. And so I came up with this overall biodiversity conservation score. I take 10 of those variables that were in this previous list and I take them and I standardize them to a scale of zero to 10. It's just doing some math. And then, then each, each one of these variable, each, each community has each of these variables, again, on a, on a scale from zero to 10, and just sum those up. Uh, and it's possible to get a, you know, a score of, of 100. If, if each of these is at the highest point it can be, each of these is going to be a 10. And you sum those up and a perfect score would be 100. So this conservation score is on a, on a range of zero to 100. And it gives a one number score on sort of the overall conservation value for biodiversity of that plant community. These seven right here are general in that they deal with uh, a, you know, basically any, any community, no matter what type, uh, again, could be evaluated on these criteria criteria. Then I use these last three here. Each one of these is sort of specific to whether it's a prairie, then it's, it's prairie quality score is going to be important. Whether it's a forest, it's native old growth score is going to be important, or whether it's a wetland, and then it's wetland score is going to be important. So each of them have a chance to sort of shine in their own way because they are also evaluated on basis of these three. These all sum to uh, 100. And just for a quick example, here's five sites in Story County. I, I, here's the, five, the, the 10 variables again. Here's the scores for um, five communities. I threw in Doolittle Prairie because that's one that we did. It's, it's publicly owned, but we kind of did it as sort of a, a, a way of making comparisons. Because we know Doolittle Prairie is you know, one of the best places in Story County. So we want to see what it scores. Well, it scores 91.7. So that seems pretty good. Now we have a frame of reference for comparing these other ones. This is a cool season grassland pasture on private land. This is a reconstructed prairie. This is an upland mixed forest, just a variety of different species. Uh, and then this is a, a, a more of a wetland, a, a wet swale. So again, the, this is the overall total conservation score. And also Story County can go in here and they can look at these and they can see, you know, well, which are the, which landowners have some of the best remaining remnant communities that we might want to work, work with. Okay, uh, I'm over, but I'm going to just quickly show you some more highlights. Um, here's a breakdown of the species again that we had. You can see the number of native native to Iowa, but not Story County, and then not native to um, North, North America. Uh, 49 plant species we found that aren't in Eilers and Rosa. That's why Eilers and Rosa needs to be updated very badly. Uh, we had 24 new records for Story County. We had nine plant species that we found that were considered to probably be gone because they hadn't been seen since 1950. So we rediscovered these historic species. Eight of them were native, one of them non. And then the last one is there were 16 species we found on the list of endangered, threatened, or special concern. So lots of important information, of course, here for Story County. And lastly, some pictures. Here's a, one of my favorite little remnant prairies that we found. Uh, it's the only place now, I think, in Story County for uh, Plains frostweed, Helianthum bicnellii. And it's one of a few sites in Story County for uh, Great Plains flat sedge, Cyperus flocomus. It's kind of a uh, really dry, uh, more of a midgrass type of prairie dominated by um, side oats grama. Here is a beautiful sedge meadow, didn't even know it existed in Story County on private land. 
found Lysomachia terrestris. This is a historic species, hadn't been seen since 1950. Found Carex canodia. This is a tan uh, and a new record for, for Story County. And finally, the last one, I want to throw in a forest. So this is one of the best um, forests that I surveyed in this nice oak basswood forest. Again, white baneberry, historic species. Hadn't been seen in Story County uh, since before 1950. Found it here. And it's the only site that we found in the entire county for butternut, uh, a species, of course, that is going downhill uh, because of the canker uh, that it has that causes the death of, of adult trees. All right, well, I went over a little bit, but there was a lot to go through here. I hope that you uh, can uh, you can use this handout, of course, and, and review it. And if you have questions, you're welcome to send me uh, some questions about any of that stuff. This is something I really feel is really so valuable to, to anyone, uh, particularly towards, of course, a, a county, a Story County, for example, or whatever county, because it's gonna give them just a huge amount of information about what's out there in their county and particularly what's on public land and who are the landowners to work with. All right. Um, one, one question here. Um, okay, how transferable are coefficients of com conservation from state to state? For not, those of us not that... transferable. <laughs> That's okay. a good question. I'm very glad you asked that because I forgot to mention that. They're definitely not transferable. Uh, do not try to use, we, we sometimes looked at other states just to see what they did with them, but it wasn't that much of an influence in what we, we did, because you can see many examples of a species being an eight or a nine in one state, and then going to another state and it's a four or a five or a three. Again, it's based upon how that species is reacting to environmental conditions and situations in that state. And so uh, they're not transferable. In fact, that's why some states actually do multiple lists, because even within the same state, they sometimes feel that they can't just have a general list for the entire state. They need to have one for like one for the Los Hills, one for the Pezzo Plateau, maybe one for the uh, rest of the state. Okay, got another one here if you've got time. Sure. Have entomologists and zoologists done analysis of conservatism of the same areas and overlaid them, yielding an overall coefficient of conservatism? I've not seen that. It would be interesting to see that done, but no, I've never seen that done. The, um, the MISM project might be a place where that kind of thing could be done because the MISM project, Multiple Species Inventory Management, they do um, plant surveys, they do vertebrate surveys, vertebrate surveys, small mammals, birds all on the same piece of ground. So uh, they, they could take that data and of course apply conservative, uh, the, the coefficients of conservatism to the plants, of course, because we, we have those and calculate uh, what the, um, the mean coefficient is or the FQI is for that, that, that site. And then see again, uh, what that means in terms of the uh, fauna that, that they see. So it would be possible to do with data that's been collected in, in that work, just a matter of someone doing it. Right, any now, other questions out there? And again, I don't know of anyone who's tried to create uh, a list of coefficients or C values for any fauna. Again, I, it, it, no, it might make sense for some groups, I suppose. I, I think I think I mentioned I thought I heard about maybe someone trying to do it for some group of insects um, or amphibians. I don't remember for sure, but I've never really seen anything published, but I haven't really looked either. So no all other right. questions? No all other right. questions in the chat. I thank you all on behalf of Lance and yeah, Golden Hill. And, in there and um, hope you learned something from this and if this is useful for you down the road. And Thank get out there next week and enjoy, um, enjoy spring. Bye.